Okay, we've got a few minutes, so you should all be here for the Mastering Your Qualitative Methodology webinar. Okay, we'll get started in a few minutes here. Just giving everyone time to get here and get settled. All right, it's that time. Welcome everyone. I am Dr. Joanna Broussard. I am a qualitative research mentor here at Statistic Solutions. And this is the Mastering Your Qualitative Methodology webinar. This webinar focuses on everything you need to include in what is what will be chapter three of the standard dissertation, the methodology chapter. If you're doing a DBA, if you're doing action research, it may be structured differently. But for a standard dissertation, this is normally chapter three. Within one week of the end of this webinar, you will receive a recording of the transaction, the transmission that will include the PowerPoint and all of the words that I have said, including my responses to any Q&A. So that way you will have that for your notes. A note on the Q&A. I have the Q&A feature ready. Given the amount of information we're going to cover and the specificity that's needed for most studies, I will be unable to answer questions about the specific nature of your individual study. I can clarify things. I can give you things to consider. But questions focused on your individual study are something that would require a consultation. That being said, please use the Q&A feature. I keep, it, I keep it up so that way I can see it because I like so when, you get, when you get your recording. This way you can have the content. I will pause at a good at a stopping point in the narrative to read the question aloud, and then I will give my response. So that way, everything is roughly together to help it make more sense as you go over this later. So that being said, let's begin. Now, we'll start with an overview of the chapter. You can see here all of the sections you're going to have in your chapter. First things first, the methods chapter, like any form of traditional academic writing, uses what's called a tripartite or a syllogistic structure. 
meaning there are three big sections, introduction, body, conclusion. The introduction, you tell us what's going to happen. You give us the background information so we're all on the same page, and you preview the body. The body, you give us all of the information you're going to tell us in all of the detail you have. And then the conclusion, you summarize what you just told us. You hit the high points. You give us a takeaway that sort of answers the question, so what? Now that I know this, what do I do with this? And you segue to whatever comes next. In Western European-based academic writing from the paragraph level, topic sentence, support, explanation, summary, to the five-paragraph essay, to the book chapter, to the dissertation chapter, to the dissertation itself, this is the underlying structure. And so you can see the introduction is the introduction. Research design through trustworthiness, that's your body. And then summary is the conclusion. So this is what you are doing in this chapter. It's a structure most of you should be familiar with by this level. And But I do find that helping people see these connections makes it easier to know what's expected of them and why we expect these things of them. Okay? So let's begin with the introduction. The introduction is one of the easiest things for you to write. And if you've had your chapter one approved, you could easily get the introduction to this chapter taken care of. Because in the introduction, you will need to restate the purpose. You'll probably also restate the problem and your research questions verbatim for what you had in chapter one and what you had in chapter two. Dissertation chairs, grad schools love to see this thing repeated again and again. So that way at the start, you, every, that way at the start of each chapter, everyone is reminded of what's going on, especially because during the prospectus and drafting phases, your chair, your committee, if you're working with outside assistance, they're seeing bits and pieces, right? They're seeing your chapter one. Then they're seeing your chapter two. Then your chapter three. Or maybe only your methodologist is seeing your chapter three. But this way, if the purpose, the problem, the research questions are all there, they're all verbatim, everyone starts on the same page. Everyone has enough knowledge about the background to then determine if you've provided enough detail in this specific chapter. And then you will preview each of the sections and don't just say we're going to go over the research design, we're going to go over data collection and sample. Give a little bit of a teaser. Your introduction should be like the teaser trailer to a movie. It gives us enough to get us excited, to let us know some of what we can expect, but it should not provide spoilers. It shouldn't give away the plot twist. It shouldn't give away the climax or the denouement. It should tell us just enough to get us excited and make us want to keep reading. Roughly, this should be about a page, maybe a page and a quarter. You don't want to go overboard. You just want to hit the high points. And again, if you're copying verbatim, you know how long this should be. Then you'll move into your research design. Sometimes this is where you'll put the RQs. 
Sometimes you put it in the introduction. That can depend on your school. That can depend on your department. It can depend on where your chair wants them. So always look at a template and always talk to your chair. But we need to know what your research questions are. We need you to identify and define the phenomenon, the case, the concept, the object of study. You will also identify your particular tradition, qualitative, quantitative, or mixed. For the purposes of this webinar, we will focus solely on 100% qualitative research and the design, case study, phenomenology, ethnography, grounded theory. You'll be telling us what you're going to do and pay attention to the next two things I'm going to talk about because you in this section, you're not just explaining to us what a qualitative case study, what a qualitative phenomenological study, what a generic qualitative study is. You're telling us what it is. You're explaining why this chosen approach is the best fit for your study. And you're demonstrating familiarity with other options by explaining why you did not choose them. Often, a grad school template will say, in addition to your particular research design, describe two to three others that were not selected and explain why they are not the best fit to answer your research questions, to address the problem, to talk about the concept or the object of study. So this will probably be about three to five pages, roughly. Type double space 12 point times New Roman. Or if you're Chicago Manual of Style for your discipline or for publication, Garamond is often equal to or preferred to, to Times New Roman, but that's specific cases. So you need to think about not just why you want to do this particular type of research, but why you're not doing other types of research. So why would you want to do a qualitative design? Do you have a lot of textual data, artifacts with written words, interview transcripts, uh, movie transcripts, books, poetry, television shows, observational notes from f the field? If you have a lot of that, a qualitative design is probably going to be a better option than a quantitative. Do you want to understand perspectives and experiences of people who have done something, gone through something, lived something, are part of a particular culture? When we get to the different methods and designs, I'll give you some examples. But if you want to understand people's perspectives, their thoughts, their experiences, then a qualitative design is going to be better than a quantitative design at getting that. Let's look at some data collection methods. Maybe you want to interview people, focus groups, whether it be one-on-one -on -one or multiple people. Qualitative analysis is much better for interview or conversational data. Again, documents with a lot of words in them. Uh, court transcripts, uh, medieval manuscripts, proceedings of conferences, 
field observations that you yourself or that others have made that are written words, journals, diaries, captain's logs of, and of various ships, ledgers from various businesses, contemporary and historical, narratives, stories being told in an oral tradition that you're recording, transcribing. This type of data benefits from qualitative analysis. Maybe you're not planning on generalizing very far beyond your particular case or a small region. With qualitative data, there are too many things that make huge generalizations challenging. There are exceptions, and we can we will talk about those later in the presentation. Maybe you don't want to test a hypothesis. With qualitative research, you just need to answer research questions. You don't need to test a particular hypothesis that you that you falsify or seek to not falsify. Maybe you don't want to work with numbers, and so you don't want to quantify your results. Maybe you don't have the money for a license for a particular statistical software application, and your school doesn't provide those, or for or whatever reason. So maybe you don't want to do that, So and you can then avoid that with qualitative data. Now, qualitative software does have its own expenses, but that's a different beast. Qualitative is often easier to do by hand without the assistance of software. So, since we're talking about research design, let's look at the five major types of qualitative research designs. The case study phenomenology, a generic or a general qualitative design, grounded theory, and ethnography. We're going to go over each one of these one at a time, talking about what they're good for, how you can do it, and some other particular considerations. Let's start with a case study. Case studies are really good if you want to look at a specific example over time for an in-depth analysis. This can be an atypical case, an exemplary case, a counterpoint, a new direction, or when you are studying one or more cases that are bounded by some uniting factor. Let's talk about an example. Um, new comic books come out tomorrow, so I was looking over what I'm going to get at the comic book store. So um, maybe all of the comic book stores in your state have an employee turnover rate of 37%, with the exception of this one comic book store that only has an employee turnover rate of 3.7%. Well, this one is behaving in a very atypical manner. So they're clearly doing something different. But what? So you so this would be an ideal case study because you would have a single case, this comic book store, that you could study over time. How would you do it? Well, one, you would probably interview various people directly connected to the case. Employees, um, management. Maybe you'll go to the comic book store and observe some interactions with employees, management, employees, customers, management, customers. Maybe you'll look over some documents, if there are any that might be relevant. But you'll talk 
you will most likely be interviewing employees to figure out why they're not leaving when others are. You'll see what's going on. You want to get a sense of the fullness of the case. Educators also use case study, often a multi-site case study for, say, exploring how people who teach English to non-native speakers at a particular grade level in a particular school district um, use the resources provided to them. What strategies are they using that are either working really well or that aren't working in a way that they should be? If they're using the same curriculum, why is it working here? Why is it not working here when it's working elsewhere in the district? This way you can figure out what's different, what makes this atypical. Maybe it's a really good example of the successes and you want to highlight this one case. Maybe a new theoretical or conceptual framework has emerged to understand the concept. And because no one has studied any cases with this new with this new co conceptual framework, because it's new, you want to take the study of ES English to non-native speakers, middle school math education, or whatever, in this new direction. You, this is good for one place over time. Multiple methods of data collection, often interviews and observations with some document analysis and the goal is to generate a rich description of the case or cases you were studying so we get a sense of any reader who comes after gets a sense of well now I understand why when everything when all the signs pointed to this type of response or this performance, we got something different. Or, oh, if this is a, an example of this, well, this is probably what's happening in the other cases in the immediate area. You want a thick, rich description of the one case or of the cases that you've united by a common factor. And you'll do this by examining the emergent themes from the, from the case. So you'll code the interviews, you'll code your observational data, you'll code any documents, and you'll see what emerges from those code that coding process. Okay, that's a case study. Case studies are pretty common. Um, your sample size will be fairly small depending on the size of the case. Again, if you are looking at one business, you'll have a sample drawn from only that business. Might be four, five, six, th three interviews. You'll have a small number, but you'll need to have multiple perspectives. Talk to your chair about how many people you would need to satisfy their requirements, to satisfy the school's requirements, and to satisfy any disciplinary field-based requirements. We will be talking more about sampling, but like I said, a case study, depending on what you're studying, you can have a much smaller sample because there may not be that many people involved in the case 
direct phenomenology is another option maybe you want to look not so much at this particular case but you really want to dig into those lived experiences for participants you want to describe the meaning that people who have participated in who have undergone an event assign to that experience Maybe the phenomenon of surviving a major hurricane while having to shelter in place. Or those who dealt with a particular tragedy. Or I had a client who was studying the practice of self-care among mental health professionals who work for community and nonprofit organizations. So she wanted to look at, you know, their experience with the phenomenon of self-care and being a custodian of their own mental health. How will you do this? You'll probably be doing in-depth interviews because you'll need to get detailed understanding of that phenomenon from the people who have experienced it. How many will you have? Um, somewhere between 7 and 12 usually for phenomenology because again you're not trying to capture the fullness of the human experience as you can see from what phenomenology does, is you're illuminating the commonality of experience. You're trying to distill all of what they've experienced into the essence of that phenomenon. What is the essence of surviving a Category 5 hurricane when you couldn't evacuate? What is the essence of working in community mental health care and trying to obtain or obtaining self-care. A professor of mine in grad school studied the phenomenon of living with the reality that you are going to die in the context of Roman Catholicism. So the phenomenon of death through the lens of the, of the Catholic faith for specific groups who were still Vatican I in their faith at a post-Vatican II world. I grew up Catholic. If that doesn't make sense to you, don't worry. It's, it's nuanced changes in Catholic, in Catholic dogma, but it was a very particular brand of Catholic dogma. And so how did that how did that particular phenomenon, the rituals, the beliefs, the community connected to it, how did that help them continue to live and put death in its proper place? That was his work. His name was Miles Richardson. He was an anthropologist. He has retired only in the sense that he has passed on. So, but phenomenology is really good for trying to figure out that core essence of an experience as understood by people who experienced it. Another very common one that you, that you might do you're, you're quite likely to do is the generic or general qualitative design. This is the catch-all. Maybe your research question or questions don't fit squarely into another design. Maybe your maybe multiple research studies in recent multiple designs have informed your understanding 
and you've brought that into your question. Maybe your focus is outward. Maybe you just want to sort of understand the experience, but not how people make sense of it. This is the only time I will mention mixed methods. Maybe what you want to do is a mixed method study. If so, a generic or a general qualitative design is, good, is probably what you're going to go with. How are you going to do it? You have a lot of options. Interviews, questionnaires, observations. This is the biggest time where I will say it depends on what you're studying and what data you need to collect. Maybe you'll do some surveys. Be careful with qualitative surveys. I do want to mention that right here. Qualitative surveys are often presented to participants either in mixed methods or in generic qual design with a few open-ended questions. You know, the essay question format. The researcher has an expectation that their participants will then give them at least a paragraph if not an actual essay in response to these open-ended questions. More often than not, what the researcher gets back is a phrase, a sentence, maybe two sentences if you're lucky. So you don't get a lot of the depth and nuance with the survey that you do with an interview. And sometimes that's because the questions weren't clear. Sometimes that's because there was some other form of misunderstanding. An interview, which we'll talk more about later, allows for that communication, that dialogue, that re-explanation. A survey, especially an online or a written survey, doesn't always allow for that. And so oftentimes clients, and when I was a professor, students found survey responses disappointing. But that is the nature of the beast. And so being prepared up front can help you plan to collect the data you need to get the questions answered. What does a generic design do? It yields an understanding of quote unquote outer world content of the experience. It's more akin to a case study, but not as in depth not as long-term. So it's often selected because it is quicker, it's easier, and it does allow for a little bit more flexibility of data collection. This is where you'll see people having around 12 to 15 participants easily, if not more. Grounded theory. Grounded theory is really good if you do want to generate theory out of the collective perspectives of a vast number of participants. Let me repeat that. Out of a vast number of participants. Grounded theory is good when there is little or nothing known about a topic. However, it is not something I advise novice researchers to do. Grounded theory is the most iterative of the research designs. You will collect your field data, your interviews, your field work your text or document analysis, and you will 
can and you will in your memos you'll analyze all of it and you'll create and from that you will create a theory about what's going on that's phase one phase two is you repeat the process with different participants and then you see if you need to modify your theory you make the modifications if you made modifications to your theory you go back out into the field and you do it again until such a point as you reach theoretical saturation the point at which data collection does not alter the theory So this is something that you'll probably have 30, 40, 50 participants, if not more. This is something that requires a lot of time, a lot of understanding and experience with your data collection methods, with theory writing, with theory generation. This is advised for at the earliest, once you've gotten tenure. Once you get tenure, then you have time to work on this because you've got to go into the field multiple times. And so it's time consuming. It's daunting. It is not something I would advise a graduate student to do. But that does happen. What does it do? It derives a theory that is grounded in the data. If you really want to do something that's generalizable with qualitative data, this is what you're going to be doing. You produce a broad explanation of a process, an action, or an interaction. You can get some very meaningful results, and I don't mean to say that this is bad, but it is a lot of work. And if you're running up against the clock for, I need to graduate soon, this will be a huge mountain to climb. So don't put yourself in that position unless there is no other option. Okay. And last, but certainly not least, is ethnography. What is ethnography good for? Understanding a problem, a practice, in its cultural context. It's good for a holistic inquiry. You want to look at networks of people, institutions, social groupings. This can be all the way from a full-scale analysis of a culture group, as was traditional with early ethnographies, where they would go out into the field, live amongst a people for two to three years, collect data, and then come back and write a monograph, which is also called an ethnography. If you want to study language in practice, whether that be, you know, what women talk about while making tamales in a Mexican village, uh, my master's thesis director studied that for one of her projects. Maybe you want to look at the performance of boasting or of dissing in hip-hop culture in the urban South, like, say, Atlanta or Dallas. That's something where you could look at that practice in its cultural context. Maybe you want to study cosplay at, a fa at an anime con. I know people who've done that. I know people who have studied intergenerational communication amongst people, amongst family members who play online video games together, 
particularly massively multiplayer online role-playing games. How they stay in contact, how they communicate, how communication changes across gender by the medium. So that's what ethnography is good for. Interviews, extended field work, participant observation, conversations. Traditionally with ethnography, you'll probably only interview a small number of people, but you will have one key interlocutor, one key informant who helps you get access to cultural practices, who helps you get access to other people to talk to. If there's a language barrier, maybe they'll help you translate. But the trade-off for having, say, three to five interviews with participants is the fieldwork, the participant observations. You're not just in the field observing a practice, you are participating in the practice. So you really get your hands wet to understand what it means to do this. That's what separates ethnography from, say, a case study or phenomenology. You're looking at it in its context, but you're also doing, so you're getting that kin the kinesic element of what does it mean, what does it feel like in the body to embody this performance, this practice, to do something that's, you know, um, a professor of mine studied uh, Mardi Gras, uh, the Courier du Mardi Gras, the, running the Mardi Gras in small villages in southern Louisiana. So you've got those, you know, what, which meant she had to make her own costume and then she had to participate in the, the, the Mardi Gras run, which is walking from house to house in town, offering to do silly things to get ingredients for a giant communal gumbo, which might include dancing or telling jokes or singing songs or chasing a live chicken things like that for the entertainment of the people you were from whom you were asking to participate in a communal feasting ritual that then culminated with a giant party in the center of town with a communal dance and a communal feast and everybody taking leftovers home but you can't just get away with watching. You can't just get away with talking. You've actually got to do. And so that's what you have, that's what makes ethnography different. The payoff is big, but the investment of time, energy, and resources is equally large. And it is a great way to produce an in-depth account of your phenomenon of study, of your problem, from the perspectives of participants and within the cultural context. What does it mean to do this and to be a part of this culture? That's sort of the big thing that we get out of ethnography. So let's talk about the role of the researcher, shall we? What is your role? As you've probably noted that depending on your research design, you may be an observer, you may be a participant, you may be both. In a sense, you may be neither. If you're not conducting observations, you may be more akin to a reporter who's trying to analyze and report on what those who have experienced or participated say. But you need to figure out what your role is because you are 
the primary data collection instrument. So you need to identify and describe any potential conflicts of interest, any power dynamics. These can be as overt as I'm interviewing people who work underneath me in my company. I'm their supervisor. To something as covert or occult to you or you don't even think about such as this is a marginalized population and I'm coming in as an academic, as a scholar. And even if you are part of that community, studying your own community, how does your position as researcher change the way or how could it change how they perceive you? Because now you have an institutionalized role that you didn't have before. So thinking about those things, thinking about potential areas of bias, like, like if you are part of the culture group you're studying, you may already think you understand it. And you may think you know what you're going to find. If you're well-versed in the literature, it's easy to go in making the assumption that, well, because the literature says X, Y, and Z, this is what I'm going to find. My master's thesis was a discursive analysis of boasting and the performance of masculinity in the Icelandic family sagas from the 13th century. 200 years worth of academic literature I poured over going all the way back to Jakob Grimm. Some of the most studied elements of these stories, the boast contest, the insult contest. And from the literature, I knew what I was going to find. I was going to find very specific boast duels where they just where they where they boasted back and forth and I was going to find insult duels where they mocked each other relentlessly and didn't boast that's what I was going to find why did I know that because the literature for 200 years said that's how we interpret these texts and I analyzed my data set with that in mind and it didn't work i had to sit and i had to look with my data and i had to pour over it and then i had to realize that the literature was over simplifying it more often than not what was classified as a boast duel simply had more boasts than it did insults. And and the name given to the insult duel by the by scholars was never used in the text. They called all of them the same thing. And so looking at it from that perspective saying, hey, the literature's wrong on how we break them into, into groups led me to then relook at how we interpreted the the concepts, the types of utterances. And I found some really neat things that way. But there are potential areas of bias. Maybe you're from the outside looking in and you think you know about this culture group because of what the news has said, because of what literature has said things of that nature. Consider other applicable ethical issues. Again, do you work at the study site? Maybe you're not a, an administrator, a supervisor, but there can still be ethical issues arising from researching your place of employment. 
What if someone mentions trade secrets or, or you know, prop proprietary information? How do you handle that? How do you report that? Do you not report that? I don't have an answer. That's something you've got to think about. Because if it happens, it's got to be dealt with in an ethical way. And so these are things to think about as early as you possibly can, because the sooner you start thinking about it, especially if you're not beyond chapter one and just planning your idea for a study, the sooner you think about it, the easier it is to deal with it before it becomes a problem. And so qualitative research, the more you plan up front, the easier it becomes to adjust when needed. So let's talk about your participants. You'll be talking about a few things in this section, your population. What is the group of people from whom your sample will be drawn? If you are studying English language middle teachers for a particular county in Maryland, your population would be English language teachers in that particular county. Just that, just that county. You don't want your population to be super broad because that can be untenable for a qualitative study. Remember, because your your population must be drawn from your sample, your sample must be drawn from your population. So if you're looking at um, ESL teachers from an entire state as your population, that means you've got a sample from different parts of the state. From You can't just do one county or borough or parish. But if that's what you need, that's what you need. Your population should be large enough to respond to the problem, but it should be small enough to make getting a good sample feasible and not too difficult. So how are you going to sample your participants? You will likely use a non-random sampling strategy. So purposive sampling. You'll look for people who can help you. Snowball sampling. You'll find one or two people who can help, and then you'll get them to put you in touch with others. What are the inclusion and exclusion criteria? So what are the characteristics people need to meet to participate? How will you verify this? The goal of non-random sampling is to find people who can help you answer your research questions. Number of participants, as I've said from the different research designs, this will vary. A lot of times 12 to 15 or 17 to 20, depending on what you're doing. What steps will you take to identify, contact, and recruit in detail? How will you, how will you change, how will you get more if you don't reach the sample size? or data saturation. These are considerations. We're moving closer to the end of the, our time, so I'm trying to quicken the pace here a little bit and get us through the rest of the, the chapter. Instrumentation, all of the instruments you're going to use, an observation sheet, your interview protocol, your document analysis guide, you, where are you getting all of these from? Will it be something that you create more than likely? Or will it be something that's already published? If it's published, you'll probably need to get permission to use it. Document review. What documents are you reviewing? How are these documents verified for accuracy? 
you need to be able to demonstrate and justify how the data sources will be sufficient to answer your research questions. And again, for each instrument, you know, you'll need to provide these details. Where, where will you use it to collect data? Who will collect data? How frequent will data collection events be? How long will they be? Interviews, 45 to 60 minutes. Focus groups, 45 to 90 minutes. How many questions on the survey, etc. How will you record the data? What are your contingency plans for, a, for data attrition? What are you going to do if somebody says, hey, can you pull my data from your study? How will you debrief procedures? What follow-up procedures will there be? Transcript verification for accuracy. Member checking to see if your results and analysis align with participant experiences and understanding. What happens if participants suggest revisions? How long will you give them? And then you'll have your data analysis plan. For each type of data, describe, you know, how this data is connected to your research. How will this help you address your RQs? What will your coding procedures be? Will you use software? How will you handle discrepant cases? If you're unsure about your coding process, I suggest Brown and Clark, B-R-A-U-N and C-L-A-R-K-E. It's simple, it's straightforward, it's well-respected. So you will go into detail, spending a couple pages describing the process of anal how you plan to analyze the data and how you plan to respond to any discrepancy amongst the findings. What happens if you have that one case that's different? You can't just ignore it. You've got to figure out how to explain it. What does it mean? And then you'll talk about trustworthiness. You know, how confident can we be in the accuracy of your findings, often through triangulation? Triangulation of methods. You know, this is why we have interviews, document analysis, observation for a lot of studies. You look at different methods, and then if the methods align, not perfectly, but it's close, then, you know, you it become it, you're more confident in your accuracy transferability rich descriptions help other researchers determine if your findings will be applicable in different cases you cannot determine if your findings are transferable to their case but you can help them out by providing rich, thick descriptions. Dependability. Are your, are your findings consistent for replication? Did you provide enough information or description of your data collection and analysis pro process? Is there an audit trail so we know what was done? Confirmability. Are the findings based on the participants and not just the researcher. That's what member checking offers. You will describe how you will establish trustworthiness through all of these methods. A couple paragraphs for each one is sufficient, but you need to not just say what people do, but say what you will do. And then you'll talk about ethics. Any agreements to gain access to participants, to research sites, etc. Talk about the process of acquiring that, IRB stuff, how you're going to ethically treat your, your human participants, 
through getting permission, recruitment, informed consent, data collection, anonymity versus confidentiality of data, which one's better for a particular study. It depends. How will you how will you establish both anonymity and comfort and or confidentiality? Pseudonyms, removing all identifying markers. How will you secure data? Who will have access to the secure data? How long will you keep your data before it's destroyed? Usually three to five years. How will you destroy the data? Wiping a hard drive, shredding transcripts, smashing an external hard drive with a sledgehammer, which is very therapeutic, by the way. These are things to think about. Check with your school for minimum requirements of how long you must keep data before it's destroyed. And then you conclude with your summary. You recap, hit the main highlights, you pull the reader along with the problem, the purpose, the questions, the method, your methodology, and then you will transition to your next chapter, which will be the results. Chapter three is the last chapter of your prospectus. Once you get one, two, and three approved, you go to the IRB, and then you've got to conduct the study. The more detail you have here, the better it is to help the IRB and the easier it is to conduct the study for you. So, this is everything that is included in your Chapter 3 of a Qualitative Research Dissertation. We've gone over the sections. We've looked at all the considerations for research design, including time and sample size. And we have, and now just a few tips. The chapter can be daunting. That's okay. Start with your problem, your purpose, and your RQs. Ask yourself, what data do I need? Who do I need to talk to to find the answers? What documents will help me? Will and what type of observation would give me the answers? Write this chapter as a recipe. I've given you the ingredients, and you'll be spelling out the particular instructions that you intend to follow. Recognize that your methods and your methodology can change over time. This chapter is what you expect to do. You may have to change it during data collection, and in the results, if you did have to make changes, You'll talk about what changed, and you'll talk about why it changed. So, should you need further assistance, we at Statistics Solutions are a full-service dissertation consulting company providing graduate students and others with timely editorial support for your dissertation and other scholarly projects. We can help you from topic development through prepping for your final defense and in turning your dissertation into an article of publishable quality. For more information on our services or to receive a complimentary 30-minute consultation that is available between the hours Monday through Friday, 9 to 5 Eastern United States time, please contact Janine Glace at info at statisticsolutions.com or via the phone number, country code 1-877-437-8622. We do not have time for questions. However, this consult the, the consultation with Janine is free. And should you have questions, she is more than capable of helping direct you to general answers that that you can get 
and getting you the expert you need to help you with wherever you are. We are here to support you should you need our help. And whether you need our help or not, we wish you all the success in your academic, professional, and personal lives. Again, I am Dr. Joanna Broussard, a qualitative research mentor here at Statistic Solutions. And from all of us, to all of you, thank you for joining us. And I hope that you have a lovely afternoon, a lovely evening, and a lovely week ahead of you. Get some rest when you can. Your body will thank you. You've got this. Have a wonderful day. You are more than welcome. And now I bid all of you adieu.